God's Ghost, His Last Command. Chapter 3 Twelfth, dash, twenty-nine hours. Year, 188.776 M41. Frag Flats, HQ. Sparshed Combat Zone, Arshion Sixtus. You checked the pod was sealed when you departed, Camp Zeno, Balson demanded as she strode along. Yes, ma'am, Lude replied, struggling to keep up with her pace. The security detail locked the container, and I double-checked it before it was stowed on the transport. How? And was it locked? Balson asked dutifully. It was, ma'am. On my life, it was. Bad choice of words, Fogart muttered privately to Lude. Your head's gonna roll for this. They were rushing down one of the inner ironways when Van Voice and Balsin, as security squad, swept the Leviathan deck by deck. Balsin's priority was to get the Lord General safely sequestered in his private quarters. We didn't even have time to bioscan them, Lud heard Balsin say over the noise of the blustering alarms. The intruders could be anyone, posing as the missing guard team to gain entry. Lud was sweating. This was down on him. Just as Fargat had taken the pleasure in nothing. Not only had Lud had been in charge of the transfer, he'd also been the one to advocate thrusting the prisoners. He had just facilitated getting a team of the arch-enemy assassins at Lord General's central command post. Everything will be all right, he tried to assure himself. The Leviathan was swarming with armed, vigilant troopers. Everywhere he looked, he saw fire teams running point and cover searches down hallways and along through deck walls, and conjuring stop and search examinations of passing crew members. No intruder, no matter how determined, was going to get far under these conditions. The hurrying party reached a heavy blast. Hatch, of Van Voigt's quarters. Stay with his lordship, Valsin told Fergo. And then marched away to take direct charge of the manhunt. Fergo followed Van Voigt's and tactician Bayota and through the blast hatch. Come on, he said, beckoning impatiently at Lud. Lud hurried after them. The guard escort took up station outside, and the heavy hatch sealed and locked. The air pressure changed immediately. Ember runes lit it up to show that the Lord General's chamber, the virtual bunker at the heart of the huge crawler, was locked down and running on its own independent systems. They were in their interroom, well appointed with settings and a table for debriefing sessions. An inner hatch led to Van Voigt's office, and they followed the Lord General in that direction. The office was functional and service issue, but piled with books, pictures, and trophies from Van Voigt's worthy's career. There was a deck with a high back chair at the far end and a couple of couches. The side door was a sleeping pod. Damn it, Van Voigt muttered. Damn it all. He glanced at Lud. Locked, he said. Yes, sir. Van Voigt shook his head. He seemed to bear no particular anger towards Lud. It seemed more as if he were puzzled or disappointed. Fargo was listening to the security channel traffic on his earpiece. Sweepers now reach deck six and seven. Internal scanners will show no sign of the intruders. Beota muted the alarm blaring in the office. The hazard light panels continued to flash. Van Voigt was pacing. Sir, Lud, said Lud, suddenly and very quietly. What? Van Voigt replied, looking around at him. I think you should remain very still, sir, Lud said, his voice trembling. Ibram Gaunt, bearded, thin, and disheveled, had slowly risen to his feet from behind the high back and chair. He was holding a chrome and silver ceremonial last pistol. It was aimed at Fargo, and only one of them with a drawn weapon. Lose your sidearms, Gaunt said. 
onto the couch. Now. Lord unholstered his last pistol and tossed it into the couch. Bayota took out his small service auto and threw it down too. I said lose them. Gaunt told Fargo, his aim not wavering. Fargo's gun was pointed at Gaunt. Don't be a fool, Gaunt said. Do you really want to start a firefight in the presence of the Lord General? Fargo slowly lowered his weapon and slung it onto the couch cushions. Van Voigt took a step towards Gaunt. Ibram? Lord General? Not quite the reunion I was hoping for. The more Gaunt spoke, the more they could all detect an odd alien cadence in his accent. Van Voigt stared at Gaunt, bewildered. Throne man, what happened to you? Follow your order, sir. That's what happened to me. And those orders included holding me hostage with my own sidearm. It was all I could find. Ibram, for the love of terror, put the gun down. Only when I'm assured of my safety and the safety of my team. How could you doubt that? Van Voigt said. He sounded hurt. Being hurt up in a summary execution at the procession camp didn't help, Gaunt replied. Neither did having my honor and loyalty ignored. That boy there was the only one who had my any faith at all in me. Gaunt indicated to Lude with a nod of his beard. But I'm not sure I could even trust him now. We were put into a cargo pod, locked in a cargo pod, and brought here like animals. There were security issues, Colonel Kamazar, Bayalta said. You must understand. You were brought here for formal identification and debrief. Like animals, Gaunt replied. By the time we were being unloaded, I didn't feel I could trust anything or anybody. I had to make preservations for the good of my troops. How did you get out of your pod? Lud asked. Does it matter? It's a fair question, Van Voigt said. My men developed many skills on good and resistant tactics. I don't think there's a lock made that can't be beat by Vorgir or Makur. Where are your men? Fogo demanded. Gaunt seemed to smile, but the expression was obscured behind a caked gray mass of his beard. His wary aim still favored Fogo. Hidden. When no security sweep will find them. Hiding something else we've got very good at. How can we resolve this, Ibram? Van Voigt asked. You would, sir. An assurance of safety for me and my team. I think you owe us that. Van Voigt nodded. My word. You have it. Unconditionally. There was a long moment of stillness. Then Gaunt lowered the weapon, flipped it over neatly in his hand, and held it out to the Lord General, grip first. Van Voigt took the pistol and put it down on the desk. Fargo held himself forward to tackle Gaunt. No! Van Voigt's bellowed. Fargo stopped in his tracks. I gave this man my word. Van Voigt roared at him. Fargo stammered. Sir, I. Van Voigt slapped Fargo hard across the face and knocked him to his knees. I'm going to send a signal. Gaunt. All right. Van Voigt said. Gaunt nodded. The Lord General crossed to the intercom. This is Van Voigt's on the command channel. Stand down, General Quarters, and cancel the search. Boss in here. Please clarify. The situation is contained. Come as our general. Follow my orders. There was a pause. Then the Vox crackled. My lord, are you under duress? No, Balsin. I am not. Please, sir. I need the clearance. Clearance... <sighs> Is that a Montague? Understood. Thank you, sir. The hazard light stopped flashing, and the distinct howl of the Kalsians outside faded. Heavy bolts automatically restrained the outer hatch of the general's quarters opened. 
The escort detail stationed outside hurried in. Gaunt stiffened. Shoulder arms, Van Voigt ordered, and the men did so immediately. Van Voigt pointed at Gaunt. Now salute him, damn you. They followed Gaunt down a huge engineer room in the belly of the Leviathan. In every hallway they passed through, personnel turned to stare, some so bemused by what they saw. They quite forgot to salute the Lord General, a tall, shaggy, filthy man in ragged leather clothes, wrapped in torn remnants of a camel cloak, leading the Supreme Imperial Commander, two commissars, an Imperial Tactician, and a vanguard of troopers. The turbine hall of the engine room in the Shemlidus and gloomy, dominated by the vast whirring power plants that drove the Leviathan systems. The air smelled of Prometheum and lubricants. Van Voyance ordered the tech adepts and the engineers out to the chamber. Here, he asked, raising his voice above the machine noise. The heat in the machine activity masked biotraces, Gaunt said. The best interference you can get when it comes to beating internal sensors. We learned that taking out the Zhezhnius in the Lacticia Hidrastic Dam. I don't know what that means, Van Voigt said. I'll trust you'll debrief fully. Of course, sir, Gaunt said, as if surprised there might be any doubt. He walked over to a wall, set Vox, adjusted the dial to speaker, and said, Silver. Silver. His amplified voice echoed along the engineering bay. The ghosts came out of hiding. It was unnerving to have them appear one by one, out of shadowed captivities. It didn't even seem deep enough to conceal a human being. The tenor troopers didn't so much emerge as materialize. All of them were as undeath, grubbly, and ragged as the commander. Their eyes were bright, weary, and cautious. Their beards and long hair were caked into dreadlocks, with what looked like gray mud. Holy throne, Van Voigt said. Major Roan? Sir, Roan replied, making an awkward salute as he came out into the light. Sergeant Val? Sergeant McCall? The two men also saluted as they came forward, McCall unwilling to look at the Lord General in the eye. The others approached. Van Voigt greeted each one as they appeared. Trooper Brosten, Sergeant Grid, Trooper Forger, Vox Officer Belton, Scout Trooper Bonin, Marksman Larkin. Gaunt looked at Van Voigt, quietly impressed. You... you know their names, sir. I sent you, and these soldiers on a mission, we both thought you'd never come back from my room. What kind of Lord General would I be if I wouldn't be bothered to remember a handful of names? Then Voigt turned to face the group of tattered ghosts. Welcome, all of you. Welcome home. Two more figures emerged from the shadows. And these I don't know, Van Voigt said. Major Sathlin Kick, Gaunt said. The tall, dark-haired woman stepped forward and bowed to the Lord General. Kirk was a principal leader in the Grecian resistance. She's come with us to the Supply High Command with full intelligence, censoring the situation on Grion. Welcome, Major, Van Voigt said. The Emperor protects. And Grion resist, Kirk replied secondarily. The other figure was abnormally tall and slender, a disturbingly tribal gray shape in a long, feathered cloak, who seemed more uneasy than any of them. Ezra Athnish, Gaunt said, a warrior of the until night gains, a sleepwalker. Welcome, sir, Voids said. The sleepwalker made no movement or response. The skin of his thin, moist-textured face seemed to have been sustained with gray clay and oval patches 
of intercessant moistix, surrounded by deep-set, apprehensive eyes. Van Voigt glanced at Gaunt. And he's here because... because I owe him, and he refused to remain behind. Van Voigt raised an eyebrow. What to? Both are missing scout trooper Markvir and Medike Kurth. Last I know, both lived, Gaunt said. But Mekinavir and Kurth elected to stay behind and Grion in support of the resistance. And a Kurth medical skills were providing invulnerable and Mekinavir, well, let me say briefly then, then and the sleepwalker Pearstons had become the elite commandos of the Grion underground. You'll make a full report on this. And Boyd said, again, I said, of course, sir. Good. Then Voigt stepped towards the ghost and shook each and every one of them by the hand, though he didn't even attempt to take the hand of the mysterious tribesman. I understand that your mission was accomplished. And more besides, the emperor will never forget your efforts, and neither will I. He glanced around. Balsin. Lady Commissar General Balsin came out of the nearby axis, flanked by arms of Commissariat troopers. More trooper rifles leveled, surged in through the engineer hatchways on all sides, and formed a ring around the battered ghost. No, Lud gasped. Argot began to snicker, despite his brushed cheek. Take them into custody, Balsin said. Gaunt stared at von Voigt in fierce disbelief. You bastard, you gave me your word. And it stands. It will not be broken. I share the safety of you and your team. But that is all. I attested to nothing more than that, Ibram. You threatened my life, the security of this HQ, and the very core of the Imperial Command here on Arteon Sextis. Take them to detention. The troopers closed in and began to manhandle the ghost away. Chapter 4 Frag Flats, HQ Sparse Combat Zone, Archeon Sexis Lude walked into the small interview cell and heard the hatch lock up behind him. The cell was crude and stark, just scuffed bare metal and rivets, low globes recessed in cages, a small steel chair and a table in front of the wire screen cage. Picked units, motions high in the corners of the cell, recorded the scene from multiple angles. The air was stale and stuffy. On the far side of the wire screen stood another empty steel chair. Lud put the plastic sack he was holding down on the deck, took off his gloves and laid them on the small table, along with his data case. Then he sat down, opened the case, and took out two paper dossiers and a data slate. A buzzer sounded, and the door inside the cage opened. Lud rose to his feet. Gaunt entered, and the door closed automatically behind him. He glanced briefly at Lud, and then sat down on the empty chair. Uh, come as Gaunt, Lud said, and took his seat again so he were face to face with Gaunt through the wire screen. I'd like to begin by apologizing, Lud said. For what? You said yesterday during the application in the law general's quarters that you didn't believe you could trust me anymore. I want to assure you that you can. If I give you any cause of that provoked yesterday's incident, I apologize. Gaunt's hard gaze flickered up and down Lud. You locked us up in a cargo pod, he said. In order to placate, no. Who would have have you shot? Besides, we can start to be realistic, sir. You have served the best part of your career as a commissar and a discipline officer. Given the circumstances, would you have handled a difficulty? Grant shrugged. Let me put it more plainly. You encounter a dozen armed renegades, no indents, no warrants, 
Their story is indeed that they are shabby barbaric, and the very least they have suffered hardships. Perhaps they have gone native. It is also entirely possible that they are tainted or corrupt, and they demand a personal audience with the most senior ranking imperial officer in the quadrant. Do you not agree that any imperial commissar would be duty bound to exercise the utmost caution in dealing with them? There was a long silence. Gaunt shrugged again, and stared at the floor behind Lud as if bored. Lud was about to continue when Gaunt spoke. Let me put it plainly then. You are unit commander. Your team has been sent on a high priority mission behind enemy lines on a personal request of the Lord General Commander. The security of the mission is permanent. Against the odds. After the best part of two years in the field, you get your team out again. Whole. Alive. Mission accomplished. But you are treated like pariahs. The soldiers of the enemy mistrusted, abused, threatened with execution. Do you not agree that any Imperial officer would be duty-bound to do anything to safeguard his men under such circumstances? Lud pursed his lips. Yes, sir, he said, within the letter of regulation law threatening the prison of the Lord General. Gaunt shook his head, sadly. I didn't threaten him. Please, sir, I did not aim the weapon directly at him, nor make any personal threat against his life. Somatic, sir. Regulation law, I fought wars in the name of the god Emperor most of my adult life, Lud. Sometimes regulation laws get bent or snapped in the name of victory and honor, I've never known the God Emperor object to that. He protects those who raise against the pretty high ambitions of life and code and combat to serve what is true and correct. I don't much care about myself, but my men, my team. They deserve better. They have given everything except their lives. I will not permit the blunt ignorance of the commissariat to take that from them, too. I am a true servant of the throne, Lord. I resent every much being treated as anything else. Lord sighed. Can't believe, sir. Gaunt nodded. You don't have to convince me. But threaten lies, your problem. I'm not the one you have to convince. Gaunt leaned back in his seat stroking his long, dirty fingers down through his heavy, warded beard, and then folded his hands across his chest, almost forming the signs of the Aquila. So, what are you doing here, Lud? he asked. Lud opened one of the dossiers on the table in front of him, and weighed down the corner of the spread card cover with a data slate. There is to be a tribunal, he said. You and each member of a team will be examined by the Office of the Commissariat individually. It is being called a brief, but there is a lot at stake. For me. For all of you. Lady Commissar General Bastian suspects taint. Oh, does she? Sir. It would be suspected of any individual or unit exposed to such length of time on enemy-occupied world. You know that. Chaos taint is very real, possibly. It may be in you, and you don't even know it. It might also... What? Lud shook his head. Nothing. Say what were you going to say. I prefer not to, sir. Gaunt smiled. There was something predatory about the way the expression changed in his face. Like a fox, Lud thought. You'd prefer not to because you fear what you have to say might enrage me, or at the very least piss me off. That would be a fair assessment, sir. Yes, sir. Gaunt leaned forward. You know what a werewolf is, son. Uh, no, sir, I, I, I do not. Lucky you. 
I've killed six of them personally. Say what you have to say. I'm big enough to take it. Lude cleared his throat. Mm. Oh, we're all right. You might be, furthermore, uh, a subconscious taint like that might also explain your paranoia and your volatile, desperate behavior. Like waving a gun in Van's voice's face, do you mean? Y yes, sir. Can't lean forward a little further. Hooked his grubby fingers through the mesh of the wire screen. He glared at Lud. His voice became a tiny, dry crackle. So you think my mind might have been poisoned by the enemy? Corrupted without me even knowing about it. And that's why I may... What? Loose cannon? Lud shrank back slightly. You asked me to be frank. You fithing little... Gaunt snarled and threw himself at the wire screen, his teeth bared. Lud leapt up as fast as the chair toppled over. Then he realized that Gaunt was sitting back laughing. <laughs> Lud, you're so easy. <laughs> Thrown your face just then. Want to go change your underwear? Lud right in the fallen chair and sat back down. That sort of display isn't going to help, he said. Can't take a joke, I see. Gaunt asked, still amused with himself. A little gallows humor. No, sir, Lud said. Gaunt nodded and folded his arms in amusement, subsiding. And if I can't, Lud added, you can be sure as hell Lady Balsian won't. Pull a stunt like that during the tribunal, and she'll have you 1096 in a flash. I have no doubt. It's clear to me that woman had a little too much starch in her drawers. Again, Lud began. Gaunt waved a hand dismissively and looked away. Lud, you're talking to me like you're coaching me. Are you coaching me? I'm trying to prep you for the examination, sir. Understand the explanation will both be verbal and medical. You have to submit to all manner of analysis scans and investigate protocols. All of you will. Barsian will be thorough. The merest hint, be it verbal or psychological, that any of you are unsound, she would declare Commissariat Edict 10. 96 on all of you. Gunt looked at the deck. I take it you recall what that edict is. Of course I do. Do you intend to prepare each and every one of my team for the hearings? Provided I have the time, yes. I'd appreciate if you pass the word along to your team members to cooperate with me. Gunt looked up. I recommend it. It's up to them. Be advised. You'll have trouble with Kirk. Fyrga, McCall, and Ezra especially, in fact. I'd like to be present when you handle Ezra. He's not God. He's not like anything you or this tribunal will ever have handled. Lud made a note on the dossier with a steel stylus. So... Noted. I'll see what I can do. So why do we get you as an advocate, Lud? Gaunt asked. You're permitted one under the rules of the tribunal, sir, Lud replied. And we don't get to pick, Gaunt asked. Lud put a stylus down and looked squarely through the cage at Gaunt. No, sir. It is voluntarily thing. The tribunal appoints an advocate... If no one volunteers, of course. No one did besides me. Feth, said Gaunt, with a sad shake of his head. How old are you, Lord? Twenty-three, sir. So a twenty-three-year-old junior is the only friend we've got. I could stand aside, allow the tribunal to appoint you... <laughs> probably get Fargo, I don't know. I didn't think you'd want that, so I put my name forward. Thank you, said Ibram Gaunt. 
Blood turned a few pages in the open dossier and replaced the data slate to weight them down. I need to clarify a few points, sir, so I'm up to speed with hearing. I'll be a greater asset if I'm not taken by surprise. Go on. This mission you referred to, you mentioned it back at Camp Zeno, too, but without specifics. It was on Grecian, right? That's right. What were the parameters? The parameters were encoded vermin in. Lud, between me and the Lord General, I can't divulge them to you. Then that makes it hard for me to go to Van Voigt's. If he gives you written clearance, I can tell you. If he comes and gives me a direct order, I'll tell you. Otherwise, my lips are sealed. To you and the tribunal. I'll do that, said Lud. He closed the dossiers and put them away. The hearings begin tomorrow. It's 1,600 hours. As mission commander, you'll be called first. Your testimony may take a day or two to hear. I'll be back at 1,800 or sooner, if I can get the waiver from the Lord General. It may be prepping for the night, if that's what it takes. One last thing, Lud said, picking up the plastic sack from the floor beside his chair and dropping it into the hopper basket built into the wire screen at knee height. I need you to shower and put this change of clothes. Um, your team will have to do the same. I'll provide a kit for them as necessary. Gaunt looked doubtfully at the sack of clothes. What am I wearing? He said firmly. I've been wearing through it all. It's my uniform. Though I don't suppose you'd recognize it anymore. Platched, repaired, sewn back together. It's been on me from the f start to finish, and it's like my skin, Lord. That's exactly the problem. You're filthy, ragged. You smell. I could smell you from here. And I can tell you, the smell isn't pleasant. I'm not talking about dirt, sir. I'm talking about sweat, sickly stench, like corruption, taint, and a gray hue on your skin. That won't come off easily. Try, scrub, and shave for throne's sake. Don't give the Commissar General any reason to suspect you more than she does. Gaunt took the plastic sack out of the hopper. So I stink, like a bastard, like a demon. The arch enemy. The commissariat guards led back along the cell block of the Leviathan's detention clerk. Grim bars, a looming strip made of the ladder, a flight along the low ceiling, and the air was damp and musty. Patches of green white corrosion mottled the iron walls. They were walking past a row of individual cages, each one contained a ghost. Young Dehim Blayton was in the first cage, sitting close to the bars. He nodded to Gaunt, a little eager, a little hopeful. And Gaunt tried to put some reassurance into half the smile he sent back. To his adjacent, as he passed. Next in the line was Kirk. She simply followed Gaunt with her caustic gaze as he went by, then looked away as he tried to make eye contact. Flame Trooper Nogus, Boston, Thrugish, and Harry was the next cage. He was standing in the back, leaning against the far wall with his meaty tattooed arms folded and his eyes closed, dreaming of Ithos sticks, no doubt. Then came Glee and Val sitting on the seal's folding down cot. The sergeant was stripped to the waist, displaying his dirty, lean torso and his battered, augment shoulder. He flipped Gaunt's lunatic salute. Just keep walking, said one of the guards. In the next cell sat Helene Larkin, huddled in the corner, looking more like a trained leather bag of bones in nerves than ever. He watched Gaunt pass as with a sniper's unblinking stare. Larkin's neighbor was Simon Owen, McKenna's Bonin, Mac Bonin, 
and darkly handsome and particularly fortunate scout trooper. Ronan was standing at the cage front, leaning forward and clutching the bars with raised hands. Any luck? Shut up, said one of the guards. Screw you too, Ronan called after them. Gaunt passed a sail holding Tona Grid. She's not cut her hair since the start of the mission, and it had grown out long and straight, returning to its original brick-brown color, strained with until gray. She'd taken to wearing it loose, swept down to the veil of the left side of her face. Gaunt only knew why. As he passed her cage, she made a quick tenth code gesture that was Ghost's shorthand for everything all right. Gaunt managed to reply with a quick nod before he was marched on to out of sight. Ezra Apnesh, or Ezra Nit was, as they all had come to know, the Antir Pristin, stood in the next cell, silent and staring, his mosaic aged face and eyes hidden behind the old battered pair of sunshades Val had given him so long ago. His die sword for Stilo Arizera, Gaunt called out quickly, in the sleepwalker's ancient tongue. Be quiet! The guard behind him cried and prodded Gaunt between the shoulder blades with his mole. Gaunt stopped in his tracks and looked round at the three armored guards. Do that again, he began. And you'll... What? Turned to the guard, putting his mole into the palm of his glove. Gaunt bit back, tried to conceal his temper. Tried to remember what Lud had told him. He turned round and continued to walk. The next cage in line had Scout Sergeant Onan McCall. The grizzled older man remained staring at the floor as Gaunt went by. Minifogia lay on the cot in the next cell. He sat up as Gaunt passed and only called out, We dead yet, Ghostmaker. His voice had a rasping monotonous quality thanks to the augmented lyrics in his corded throat. The lingacy of the old war wound when the guards kicked the bars of Forgia's change as they went by. Oh, you think so? You think so? Forgia called after them. Come back here, you fifth wife. Come back here, and I'll make your mama weep. The threat was curiously dry and flat muttered in the monotone. It was almost comedical. Ron was in the final cage as they passed. He was sitting on the floor near the front, his back against the left-hand cell, petition. He didn't even bother to look up. At the last cage, the block, the guards slit the barred cage open. Gaunt looked at them. Sharapen, he asked. We'll be back in twenty minutes when the guards replied. Gaunt nodded and stepped into the empty cell. The guards slid the cage shut, and the reverting cling of the metal on metal locked it and walked away. Gaunt dropped the plastic sack onto the floor cell and walked across the right hand piston and slithered down, his back to it. Near the cage mouth. So, what's the story, Abram? Ron asked quietly from the other side of the wall. Running up to our necks, Eli, Gaunt replied. My bad call, I think. Pushed them way too far. It was a long pause. Don't beat yourself up, Run said. We all know why you called it like you did. They're threatening us like shit. You can take chances. Maybe I should have. We're facing a tribunal. Baoshin's in charge. Van Voigt's may or may not be on my side any more than what I did. Combat necessary, Brom, Ron replied, strategically. If we stayed in that fething pod, we might be all right right now. One better situation. I should have trusted Lou. That fifth? We're all going to have to trust him now, Elam. That fifth's our only friend. Pass the word along. We'll have to comply with his every instruction and recommendation. Or we're blindfolded with our backs to the wall. 
Why? <sighs> the acquisition of Chaos Taint. Not to prove. How did the disprove, Eli? As a Kamazar, I'd always... Uh, on the side of caution. Shoot first, you mean? Shoot first. Fifth. Lud's in our corner, and I may be able to swing Vin Voids around. If I can get any time with him. Make sure the ghosts cooperate with Lud. Whether you like him or not, he's our only decent card in our hand. That in order? More than any order I've given you. Consider it done. Gaunt looked over at the swinging plastic sack nearby. Lud wants us to shower and clean ourselves up. Get new fatigues. Get fresh. Shaved and scrubbed for the hearings. I'm as fine as I am. No, and I'm not kidding. We stink of filth and corruption. We reek of what they think is taint. Everyone does. Everyone does this, or they'll answer to me. Ezra won't like it. I know. And Kirk. I know. Leave it to me. You gonna follow my advice? Rune asked. Khan shook his head. Rune's advice, repeated two dozen times in the last few days, had been to sell Kirk out, to give her the, the commissariat in exchange for the ghost's lives. He never liked her. And that was crazy, because in the last ten months she'd given Roan so many reasons to do so. Well, then it's Kirk. Had a, was a brave, driven officer. But there was something about her that was inherently untrustworthy. In Gideon, she suffered under the arch-enemy corps occupation too long. She learned that essential skill on the side die-hard resident fighter. That quality was both a blessing and a curse. No one, not a friend, not a family member, not even a life partner was beyond betrayal if it benefited the cause that made her as mysterious and unpredictable as a razor snake. Gilk had been Ilum Roan's lover for the past eight months. Roan desired her, but he still didn't like her much. Or trust her, even slightly. So what happens now? Ron asked. They'll start with me. You'll be next, I'm guessing. Stick to the facts and observe our clearance unless I tell you otherwise. Got it. Fifth. I can't believe I'm thinking this, but... We have been safest there on Gurion. Gaunt grinned. Yeah. Maybe. We had our chance and we took it. But he get off world with the news about Stirum. And about the sun's demands of duty, Eli. And this is how they thank us, Ron said bitterly. Gaunt heard him slide closer to the edge of the wall. Rune's dirty hand appeared through the bars. I never want to go to Gryon, Gaunt heard him say. I thought it was madness. I thought it was suicide. And so nearly it was. But I did what you ordered and what the God Emperor deserved. And by faith, I never expected it to turn out like this. We're loyal soldiers of the Imperium, bro. After all we did and all we sacrificed, where the hell did justice go? Gaunt reached his own hand out through the bars and clasped runes. It's coming, Eli. It's on my life. It's coming. I want this quashed, Van Voigt said. After what they did, Bastian replied. Van Voigt waved his hands as if brushing crumbs away from his lap. We treated them badly. I owe them. Nothing, sir. You owe them nothing. If they are tainted, that's the bottom line. Whatever mission they accomplished, whatever great service they did for you uh, and the crusade, if they've come back tainted... It's the end. We take no chances. We would be derelict in our duty to the Golden Throne if we did. You're such a bitch, Bersian, Van Voigt said. Thank you, Bartho. I try. 
Seated at the long debrief table in his chambers, Van Voigt looked sidelong at Vajota. Are they tainted? Ended. He asked. Bearded keyed open a data slate. Medical sands say no. Though there is a significant degree of obscurity for all their filth and organic corruption, they seem to have survived exposure to what we might think as actual Point of taint. order, Lord General. Master Bertrand raised a hand. Is a member of the Departum Tendike in Pilios. Since when did he get to rate a psychobiological evidence? It's not his field. Van Voigt got to his feet and went to the sideboard to pour himself an anesthetic. As an afterthought. And a sad gesture of solidarity. He filled the thimble glass with cellar instead. And it did as my right-hand man. He also knows Gaunt and the ghost of old. I asked him to bring his close security and eye for detail to their case. Go on, Bayota. Bayota cleared his throat. I am not an advocate for a specialist material lawyer. Madame comes our general, as you indicate, but my mind is trained to a superior level in the possessing of evidence and intelligence. As far as I could determine from the Medicaid and psychological reports, Gaunt and his men are not tainted. They are generally damaged in many ways, but they are tired, scared, traumatized, and unappreciated. But there is no sign of actual taint. Medicaid and toxicological scans agree. They are physically infested lice, worms, bacteria, and they show perplexing registers of some kind of toxin or venom that they have built up the resistance to. They are scared, they are battered, and they are strung out. They may never again be fine warriors we once knew, but they are not tainted. Nelson nodded. I don't agree. At least, I am not convinced. Lord General, you trusted your man, Bayota, here to process the data on your behalf. I saw fit to call upon the services of another expert. Did you? Van Voigt asked. Barson turned and gestured to Fargo, who was waiting by the door. Fargo opened the hatch, and a short, thick-set figure walked in. He was wearing a dark brown leather coat, reinforced with patches of chainmail. His grain hair was receding but a tight black goatee covered in chain of his face that was contagious, almost sunken in aspect. His eyes were entirely dark blue, without a hint of white. Lord General Van Voigt's, Balsian began, may I present? Lornas Wilt, Van Voigt's finished. Lornas and I know each other of old, Balsian. How far are you, Master Inquisitor? Very well, Lord General, Walt replied in soft, clipped tones. Van Voigt turned to Bayota. Inform Junior Lord that the Inquisition is now involved. Bayota got to his feet. I don't believe that necessary, my lord, Valsian said. I do, Victoria, Van Voigt snapped. You just upped the ante. Lud needs to know that. Throne. Gaunt needs to know that. This is acceptable, Welt said, politely. Bjorn left the room. Welt took a seat at the table beside Balsin. I've received the data, the Inquisitor said. It's a tough call. These people have served their Imperium credibility and have given their all. However, for the safety of us all, I believe they should be put to death quickly and quietly. Van Voigt glared at the Inquisitor. That is a brutal... It is the price you pay, my lord. The price of this mission you had sent them to undertake. They did what you ordered them to do, and for that they should be celebrated. But there is no way they could have come out of that nightmare untouched. It would have been better for them if they died on Grion. You sent them to their deaths after all. The only nagging problem 
is that they come back and now you're faced with doing the dirty work Chaos failed to do for you. You must execute them. If they survived hell, I sent them into, Van Voigt said, then I'll give them a chance. Well nodded. Hence, the hitting. We'll be compassionate. I hope so, said the Lord General. Fagot approached Bassian and handed her a slip of paper. My lord, I am called away briefly. Van Voigt nodded, following Fargo out of the hatchway. Bassian asked quietly, Is it true? Yes, ma'am. The cage hatch, the detention lock, slid open, and Bassian walked down the block, Fargo telling her, the Lady Commissar General stopped at one of the cages. You wanted to see me? She asked. Sebastian Kirk got to her feet and walked to the cage front. Yes, I want to cut a deal. Ooh. I am really liking this book already. We're barely on the fifth chapter. Starting the fifth chapter in the next video. I like this. I want to do two chapters of this per video because I want to give you, the viewer, listener, a lot more for Gaunt's Ghost. If there are any other Gaunt's Ghost books you want me to read after this one, let me know in the comments down below. I'm actually writing down all the book recommendations that don't have any uh, audiobook at all. If they have them, Go to the main person, the main source, which is Black Library. I'm just doing these for myself and others that, because you're all awesome people. And I thank each and every one of you that listen to these videos. Anyways, I've been me. You've been you. And I can't wait to see you in the next video. So until then, bye-bye.